stream and he's getting the video camera going. Okay, you're recording. He, he thinks it's going to make me nervous. I, you know, fine. Hi, how are you guys? <laughs> how, do you, how do you get this? Oh, no, this sign up sheet. Oh, see, he doesn't want to be on the camera. He's ducking. You <laughs> are. will be on it. Good morning, everybody. My name is Bill or William Lenches. I'm the curator and executive director of the 12th Armored Division Memorial Museum in Abilene, Texas. And uh, any of y'all ever been there? No. no. Okay, a couple of you have, a couple of you have not. We've got brochures and my card up here, so do please feel free. Uh, and what we're on about today, the topic of the lecture is the late war, spring of 1945. What was happening in the war, the bigger picture. But more importantly, what was happening with the men of the 12th Armored Division. Uh, because they undertook a couple of very significant actions uh, that are largely overlooked in history books, and we'll get to that a little bit later. Before I do that, though, I want to tell you a little bit about the division, a little bit about the men. Um, starting off with the museum, though, uh, we are, I, I found out while writing my thesis a couple of months ago, the only museum dedicated to a division that was stood up for World War II and deactivated thereafter. Largely known as World War II only divisions. We're also the only complete archive of a World War II only division. And all of that is down to one guy, Major General Roderick N. Allen, the commanding officer of the 12th Armor during his time in combat. The division was stood up in September of 42 uh, and deactivated in January of 46. And when he heard that the unit was going to be deactivated, General Allen looked back at their combat history and said, if they deactivate us, all of this history is going to go away. So what he did was went to each of his battalion commanders and said, I want you to appoint historians for each battalion. I want you to get every man's name, address, and phone number. I want you to collect every scrap of paper and hold on to every piece of paper that was up channeled or down channeled. We want a complete record of everything we did here. And so because of his foresight, this huge archive existed. Got shuffled around to a few places, wound up at Abilene Christian University, uh, and eventually, in 2001, the men of the division pooled their money and said, you know what, it's time to build a museum. And so along with all the paperwork, a lot of artifacts have also been saved, original weapons, uniforms, photographs, v-mails, all the raw material of history. And since most of the crowd here is adult, uh, I can actually tell you a little bit about it. Our primary job and what we do. Um, <clears throat> As I tell children when they come in the museum, and we do get the eighth graders, every eighth grader at Abilene Independent School District comes to see us uh, when they're reading Anne Frank's Diary of a Young Girl, to get what we call context. Because here's the thing, the way social studies is taught in grade school nowadays, when children are reading Anne Frank's Diary, they've had no prior exposure to the Second World War or the Holocaust. They literally don't know anything about the world situation. So what happens? All they read in this book is what Anne Frank saw, felt, thought, and heard. We have to tell them what happened. We have to step back to 1920 and talk about the rise of fascism, the failure of the Versailles Treaty, the rise of the Nazi Party in Germany, eventually the Nuremberg Laws, and how the Holocaust came to be. And what I tell them is our most important job, because our job is we are a teaching museum. We're here to talk about the World War II experience, its impact on American society and the world in the latter part of the century, and lasting until today. The most important thing that these kids can learn when they come into my museum, besides the lesson on the Holocaust, which I think is incredibly significant, is this. How to tell a good museum from a bad museum. Bad museum, pile of stuff with a door. And unless you're interested in that particular kind of stuff, you're not going to learn much from it. What does a good museum do? It uses all of that stuff, the artifacts, the raw material of history. In our case, uh, the uniforms, the weapons, the equipment uh, that the men used and carried, the stuff they captured from the enemy and thought was important enough to bring home as a souvenir, the letters and photographs that they received and sent. And we use those to tell a story, to tell you a little bit about the human condition as it was at that point from 1942 to 1946. Simply put, we do what I call solving the mystery of the dead squirrel. What? Solving the mystery of the dead squirrel simply means this. You bring me a dead squirrel, poor deer to part of the critter. What are the only two things I'm aware of? It is dead, 
and it used to be a squirrel. Not really useful, but tell me where you found the squirrel. On the side of the road with tire tracks on it, Dad did it for the squirrel. Simmer away in a stew pot at Kenny's house, good day for the hunter. The difference between roadkill and a meal is in context, and so what we do is we use these objects to paint a picture. People come to the second floor of our museum, we have a huge hall or gallery of captured Nazi artifacts. And a lot of them look at it and think, is this some kind of shrine to National Socialism, the SS, the German Army, the Nazis? No, it's anything but. What's the context of that collection? Every piece on display at our museum that has a swastika on it or is of German origin was taken as a token of surrender by a member of our division from a surrendering German in the regular army or the SS. So if it's a shrine or a token to anything, it's a shrine to victory. And also the fact that the men who participated in the liberation of Europe were sufficiently proud of what they had done that they wanted to bring home physical reminders. General Patton, in his speech before the invasion of Sicily, talks about 40 years from now when you're sitting around your fireside with your grandchild on your knee, and he asks you what you did in the Great World War II. Well, they would bring home items, artifacts, and show them off. A couple of great examples of tiny, what we're going to talk about a little bit later. Uh, of course, this is your typical Nazi armband, uh, worn at political rallies and on the uniform of the early SS men and uh, the Gestapo later on. And, Believe it or not, this is the single most numerous artifact in our museum. We've got a number of them on display, but if you go down into our vault, our archive, it turns out that when everybody showed up with their duffel bag to donate stuff to the museum, they had at least a couple of these. They also had a bunch of the Nazi flags, because it turns out that when the Nazis took over and rebranded Germany as National Socialist Germany, it was dictated that every building that faced a main street had to have a swastika flag hanging from it during parades. And so literally millions were manufactured. Most of the ones in our archives are not complete. They're probably missing about a quarter because a popular gag among the men in our division was to capture these flags, cut them up, and cut them into patches for cleaning the bores of their rifles. It was just one of those little things that they did so they knew they were contributing to victory. And by the end of the war, how much was missing from your flag dictated how much action you would actually see, how often you fired your rifle. Um, this got to be one of my personal favorite artifacts. And you look at it, again, it's about the context. It's just a brick, a chunk of brick with some mortar stuck to it. Kind of old, kind of money, kind of dirty. How could this possibly be important? Well, this comes from the front gate of one of the sub-camps of the Dachau concentration camp system. And one of our tank commanders, Carol Bland, had to pick it out of the suspension of his M5 uh, Stuart light tank after breaking that gate down. He then held on to it and put it in his footlocker as a souvenir of what he thought was the best day of soldiering he had ever done. So again, what we do when we use these artifacts is not to say, oh, look at the neat thing I've got. It's showing people how and why. A couple of other great little examples. Uh, a lot of these, by the way, and what, how I use them comes from questions that kids ask me. And I gotta say, there used to be a television program, right? Kids say the darndest things. They also ask the darndest questions. And it really made me up my game and think more about how we teach and not to presuppose. With y'all who are adults, I can talk about things and you understand them when everyone had a landline telephone in their house, for example, or when phones had rotary dials. Well, history is one of those disciplines where we're not born with any way of knowing it or figuring it out for ourselves. Think of it this way, mathematics, okay? You look at things and you start counting on your fingers, you can develop a basic grasp of mathematics. You can teach yourself how that works. Physics. You drop something, it's going to go towards the ground. Objects attract one another. Okay, I've got that. I can experiment and learn more. History is not that way. In the span of human existence, all of us basically are, I just got here, man. I have no idea what happened before I got here. So it has to be taught. And more importantly, the lessons of the past have to be taught. 
Uh, we had a display of mess kits and the equipment that soldiers used for eating. From the cafeteria trays they used at Camp Barkley, the mess kit they used in the field, and the, for them, very fancy officer's mess kit that was used in the field, speckleware, basically what you use camping nowadays. And it had never occurred to me, but a kid asked me a question. He goes, why did they bother with all that? Why didn't they just stop at McDonald's? <laughs> that question right there, the idea that we literally have no idea what the world was like before we got here made us, as soon as that tour was over, sit down and seriously rethink how we taught, not just the Second World War, but history generally. Another great example of that is I have three nephews, God bless them, great kids. And when I took the job as a World War II museum curator, I figured it was time for me to start educating them. I sent them a copy of one of the better World War II movies made in the 60s called The Longest Day. It's pretty much an hour by hour recount of the Normandy invasion. Very historically accurate, a great way to get started. Two days later, I got a frantic call from my oldest nephew. He said, Uncle Will, is it? Yes. When you were a kid, Anna, did they have color yet? <laughs> what? Well, yeah, because I'm looking at this movie, and it's in black and white and gray. I mean, when did they invent color? <laughs> and I had to explain to him that color has always been here, just that we didn't always use film that captured it. So it all gets back to the idea of there's no such thing as a stupid question. Because the difference between stupidity and ignorance, ignorance is not knowing something. Stupidity is refusing to know something, refusing to learn something. And so we kind of stepped things over a little bit and started teaching things in a little different way. When you talk about kids, you know, how the soldiers ate during World War II, well, they have a pretty robust reenactment outfit, a living history program in our museum. And what do we do? We recreate the rations as carried by American soldiers during World War II. Uh, looks pretty grim. At the beginning of the war, the American soldier in the field who didn't have time to get a hot meal called the A-ration, where they'd set up a kitchen and actually feed you a hot meal, was issued two of these cans for every meal. C-ration, C stood for can. There were three, count them, three flavors of C-ration. Your breakfast meal was corned beef hash. Your lunch meal was pork and beans. And your dinner meal was beef stew. Now, I like all three of those items, but if I have to live on the same thing for six weeks in a row, eight weeks, 10 weeks when I'm in the field, I'm gonna develop a unique and powerful hatred of that food. The best way to get a rise out of our World War II veterans when we have our unit reunion every year is to walk by them as they're eating dinner with a can of pork and beans. Hey, you want some? They react almost violently, and, but then they start telling stories. Because the memory of that one little thing jogged four or five things a day. Or one thing I learned about was the fact that uh, of the three flavors of, of sea ration, the most popular was beef stew. Because it had beef and vegetables and gravy. It was pretty good. You had some crackers to it. It's not a bad meal. So, guys further back on the supply chain would take the crates of rations off the boat and remove all the beef stew and put in one of the other meals. And so our guys on the front line who've been fighting for three, four, five days open a fresh can of, a crate of sea rations and they find they've got nothing but pork and beans for the next week. Now, of course, we ask kids to get a giggle out of them. Would you like to live on pork and beans for a week? No. More important, would you like to share a two-man tent with someone who's eaten nothing but pork and beans? <laughs> And the look of horror really makes it come home for them. Tim's daddy is in Iraq right now in the field, and he had two dehydrated meals in one day, and for dinner, for his hot meal, he got a hot dog and some beans. Yep. And that's today. Exactly. The funny thing is, the more things change, the more they remain the same. I've deployed multiple times in my career. First Gulf War, I went to Kosovo in 99. Uh, Kosovo was a horrible place. Uh, the one good thing was we had decent hotels and decent food. Uh, the duty itself was, well, you're getting between the perpetrators and the victims trying to stop the flow of bullets. Not a great place to be. 
First Gulf War, though, yeah, we had the MREs, the brown bags of death, for three meals a day. And uh, like everything else, like the, 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 uh, the pork and beans and the corned beef hacks that our guys from World War II ate, there were meals during the Gulf War that were universally reviled. Uh, so nothing actually ever changes to, to, to a great extent. Now, later in the war, we came up with this. This is called the K-ration. Uh, named after the doctor who designed it, a nutritionist named Kynes. And it was a big improvement over the, uh, the C-ration for a couple of reasons. First off, it came in a bunch of different flavors. Your breakfast meal was always some kind of eggs. And the reason I say some kind of is because pretty much every canned food factory in America was manufacturing. And they didn't have set specified menus. They literally canned whatever came in the door. So sometimes it was eggs and cheese, sometimes it was eggs and bacon, sometimes it was just eggs or egg whites, but it was always some kind of eggs, enough variety to keep you interested. Your lunch or dinner meal was always cheese, some kind of cheese. Uh, if you like stuff like cheese whiz or American cheese on your sandwiches, that process was invented during the Second World War by the Kraft Company to take the nutritional value of milk, condense it down into something that could be canned and shipped very quickly. And your supper meal was always some kind of meat. And again, can't be more specific. Look at original cans. You'll see beef, chicken, pork, turkey, any combination of the two. I've actually seen a veal and pork loaf. And basically ground up, salted, spiced, and put together in a, in a block like Spam. The big improvement of these was I take two of them. First off, six of these cans weighed about nine pounds. Remembering most of the guys who fought World War II were about 5'1", weighed about 125 pounds. An extra 9 pounds is significant when you're already carrying 60, 70 pounds of equipment. The other big improvement is this. Once you open this box and dump everything out, pretty much everything is small, wrapped, and meant to fit in your pockets. So, you know, for example, I'm wearing a, a later war a set of trousers here. These are the pattern 43 trousers that have been modified with pockets on the sides. You literally carry a day's worth of food, four pounds of food, in your leg pockets and just grab out a snack every time you needed it. A whole lot easier to deal with. Now, I won't say that we're statists at my museum, but I will say this. When you're in the Living History program, it's not just about putting on a uniform and acting snazzy. You need to understand how these guys lived. And so what we do is we go out and we have encampments. We camp out at air shows and reenactments and things like that. And you live in a two-person shelter half tent, and you eat K and C rations for a weekend. Now, there are no originals left that you could actually eat. But you can find the people who made the food originally, buy the modern equivalent, and issue that out to your troopers. And uh, I'm terrible. I actually found the one company in the world that makes the little tin can of processed cheddar cheese. They're in Australia, they're called Biga, and it's widely considered horrible, salty, nasty, the worst cheese you could ever eat. But if you're in my living history program, for a weekend, this is lunch every day. <laughs> and again, the idea here, not just tooting our own horn about how hardcore our program is, no, really saying that the only way you can teach effectively about this stuff is to experience it the extent you can. Uh, a few other things, let's see. Key teaching points that we do at the museum. We talk about America as the arsenal of democracy, how even before the war started, President Roosevelt had said, we need to provide the tools of victory to our allies, because we're in this unique position. America has an ocean on either side of it, and so long-range bombers can't reach us. Our industry can keep producing things. <laughs> but something else kids don't understand was how, a total, how much of a total effort World War II was to the American public. They uh, don't know, many of them, that we actually are fighting two active wars today. <clears throat> Three if you count the fact that Korea is only a ceasefire and not an actual armistice. Unless you have a member of your family in the military, you honestly don't think about it very often. During World War II, pretty much every man of draft age was carrying a rifle. We went from having 400,000 men in uniform in 1940 to 16 million by the end of the war, which means for every soldier in 1940, there were 16 more. Excuse me, there were, there were 32 more. Uh, an incredible huge increase. So what that meant was we had to produce a lot of equipment and uniforms very quickly. 
you look at the typical German soldier's uniform of World War II, it's very well tailored, a lot of insignia and bits and bobbles on it to show you how important this guy is. The American uniform, not so much. Uh, literally manufactured as quickly and as simply as we could. The term good enough for government work was not an insult during World War II. It literally meant make it sturdy, make it simple, and make as much of it as you possibly can. It's funny, actually, the design for the jacket, field jacket worn during World War II, the Model 43 field jacket, was so clever and so good that the Air Force kept it unchanged until about 2004. They just changed the color of the fabric and then zippers and Velcro and little stuff like that. The first time I was home on leave from the military, it got cold outside, so I put on a field jacket. My grandmother and great aunt, who had come to visit, went crazy. Because during World War II, they had proudly worked in what were called sweatshops in Newark, New Jersey, producing just that uniform. And my great aunt showed me scars on her hand from where the sewing machine had gotten away from her. And seeing that jacket reminded her of how much she never wanted to have to make another one again. And that led just to the point that <clears throat> it didn't matter what a company was manufacturing on the eve of the Second World War. It mattered what they could manufacture. For example, you know, the, the main battle rifle of the American Army, the M1 Garand. Well, this was incredibly high technology for its time. Semi-automatic, gas-operated, eight-round internal magazine. I mean, this weapon was the super weapon of the battlefield. Everyone else was carrying a bold action hunting rifle. Well, not everyone needed one of these. Your typical frontline rifleman, whose job is to shoot the enemy a couple hundred yards away, he needed one. A truck driver or a cook or a military policeman on the rear echelon needed a lighter rifle, so they built one called the carbine. Since this was high tech for the day, had very precise metallurgy, very close tolerances, only firearms manufacturers could make this. Most of these during World War II were made by Springfield, Armory, and uh, the Winchester Repeating Arms Company. The carbine, though, used a little tiny 30 caliber pistol round. But not very prone to failure, not enough powder or explosive to blow up, just enough force to put the bullet where it needs to go. So 10 different companies manufactured these. Uh, most of them were manufactured by General Motors in plants that used to make parts for civilian automobiles instead of the simple trucks and tanks they were making during the war. My personal favorite is one made by the Underwood Typewriter Company, followed closely by Rocco the Jukebox. Because again, there were certain things that we just didn't need more of during the war. And so these people could shift over and start manufacturing things. Now, our men, the men of our division, are very lucky. Being formed in 1942, America was already at war. The sense of urgency was already there. They formed at Camp Campbell, Kentucky in September of 42. Trained there for a year uh, in, in uh, Kentucky and in Tennessee, then came to Camp Barkley. By this time, American production had truly hit its stride, and the most modern equipment, uniforms, weapons, were all being issued to these guys there, field testing them over, over uh, uh, on the ranges and live fire areas around Camp Barkley. When they got to Europe, basically, the propaganda narrative of what people thought was going on, what they were seeing in the newsreels and reading in the newspapers every day, was that, you know, December of 1944, the relief of Bastogne, the Battle of the Bulge, once that battle was over, in the American public's mind, thanks mostly to propaganda and newsreels, it was all over but the shouting. The Germans had no serious fight left in them. Well, that didn't really pan out for the men of our division. Because if you study the Battle of the Bulge, you'll learn that in addition to the troops who actually attacked into Bastogne, you had 70,000 troops in reserve who were there to be committed in case things wavered and it looked like we were going to get our troops relieved. These troops were only to be released on the personal order of Adolf Hitler himself. Hitler was unfortunately unconscious on pain medication because of a back spasm and never committed these troops. So, the 101st Airborne was relieved at Bastogne, and everyone said, onward to victory! Ten days later, those 70,000 men augmented by another 5,000 from the 10th SS Panzer Division attacked from the north into the city of Hurlesheim, France. 
the state of advance for the American Army at that point was basically <clears throat> all along the Rhine River, everyone had what they called Rhine fever. They were racing to get there as quickly as they could. Everyone wanted to be the first to cross the Rhine. The result was an incredibly long front that was one division deep for relief, for resupply, or uh, having additional troops coming to reinforce you. It was literally almost a week's march. So, our guys at the city of Hurlishan, right here, fought possibly the bloodiest battle of the European theater of op operations, definitely the largest single unit defensive action over the course of 13 days. 11,000 Americans versus 75,000 Germans. The key for the Germans was to punch through us at Hurlishan and go 30 kilometers south to Strasbourg for two reasons. Politically, Strasbourg was incredibly important to the Germans. It was the, and the reason it was important to the Germans was because it was incredibly important to the French. It had been liberated in November of 44. It was the capital of the Alsace region of France. And de Gaulle said, if this city falls again to the Nazis, the French will no longer fight under Allied command. Now, practically speaking, for the German army, there was no chance that they were going to be resupplied by their own people. By this point in the war, Allied strategic bombing, Americans during the day, British at night, are destroying every factory, every marshalling yard, all the rail facilities that the Germans have. The 10th SS Panzer Division, in fact, was told, yes, take Strasbourg, that's important, but go five kilometers west to the city of Nancy, because that is a large, Allied supply depot. There you will find vehicles, fuel, weapons, equipment, food, fuel, everything you need to fight on for a couple more months in occupied territory. Unfortunately, at this point in the war, as we said, everyone is one unit deep. So for 13 days, 11,000 men from our division held out against 75,000 Germans. We lost two thirds of our fighting strength, two complete battalions of infantry killed, captured, or wounded. Two complete battalions of tanks destroyed or captured. Gained us the nickname the Suicide Division from the Germans. We held. The Germans tried to attack across the bridgehead on the 20th of January, and they found out that even though they'd knocked out a lot of infantry and tanks, they hadn't done anything to our field artillery. Now, our gun, the 105mm, M7 pre-self-propelled howitzer had longer range and a better punch than anything the Germans had. It came as an absolute shock as they crossed the bridgehead that their vehicles just kept getting destroyed the minute they touched dry land. Our guys started firing at sun up and stopped firing right about one o'clock when the last few vehicles retreated back across the Rhine River. The 10th SS Panzer Division, whose major job had been to capture as many supplies as they could, actually did manage to capture 12 American Sherman tanks during the, the engagement. They were loaded up on rail cars and sent east to fight against the Russians who were advancing uh, along well, a pretty wide front by that time. Our guys, on the other hand, two weeks later, this is tying into American production and how much, of, how much of what we could produce how quickly during the war. Less than two weeks later, we have a complete new complement of vehicles, the latest version of the Sherman tank with the bigger gun and the better suspension. All of our missing or killed or captured men, injured men, have been replaced, and we're fighting again. Literally no rest for the weary. Now, the rest of the, uh, of the uh, time west of the Rhine River is spent with the French First Army, capturing Germans in the Colmar pocket, basically cut off and capture about 10,000 German troops that would have formed the bulk of defense in that region once they crossed the river. Then Patton's pushed to the Rhine in March, 14 days of very little sleep, living on canned rations, set a record that stood until the first Gulf War. Boys from our cavalry reconnaissance squadron that traveled 75 miles in 75 hours under constant enemy fire. 
they were given the presidential unit citation. And like I said, the only thing that uh, that uh, superseded that was during the first Gulf War, the push to uh, to Baghdad, because well, to be blunt, they weren't facing much of an army at that point. So this brings us to what was supposed to be the topic of this lecture, even though we're halfway through it: the Spring of '45 and the situation for our boys. Now. You'll notice this looks like a plate of spaghetti. And this is something that happened in World War II that has been reenacted since over and over, but didn't exist before then. The concept of a mechanized force and what it can accomplish. You're looking at the period from basically the end of March to the middle of April. Our men covered pretty much the breadth, complete breadth of Germany. <laughs> and about half of the depth because as an armored division it wasn't like your typical straight leg infantry who have to walk everywhere uh, it wasn't like the airborne who were dropped in and had to be resupplied these guys literally traveled with every vehicle tool weapon and supply they needed to conduct sustained operations in the field so our job in the late March, early April time frame, was simply to serve as what amounted to troubleshooters or firefighters, where they found a village or a city where there was significant resistance, the regular infantry would pull back and call in an armored division. And if you look at the insignia for an armored division, composed of three colors, yellow, blue, and red. Yellow, of course, is the color of the cavalry, which, you know, during the period that Kenny reenacts was men on horses. For us, it was men in steward like tanks and armored cars who could move at 45 to 50 miles an hour to scout. Also, our men in Piper Cubs who would fly over the battlefield looking for the enemy. Uh, the red, of course, are the artillery, and their job was to simply lay a hurt on every place the enemy could be hiding a tank. And then our infantry would go in and mop up. That's the complete package. That's literally everything the Army could do on the ground, every combat arm. And so our job was simply to go everywhere, do everything as ordered. If you ever want to have a great time, we've got a complete set of after-action reports for our division uh, for this time period. And just try and find every town on a map, I dare you. Some of them are so small that they were never actually put on a map and they've since become farms or whatever, but it was just, it's amazing to try and trace the progress of this. This brings us to the late April time frame, where the two most significant things our boys did in their minds uh, happened. The first happens when our boys get to Dillingen. Now, when they were with Patton's rush to the Rhine, the whole idea was to get to the Rhine River as quickly as possible, seize any intact heavy bridge so we could cross large numbers of men and vehicles. That never happened. The Germans at that point were still well organized enough that they could destroy bridges as our guys were getting there. We eventually had to cross the Rhine on pontoon bridges and build bigger bridges later. Dillingen, though, you're talking about South Central Germany heading into Southern Germany. Perhaps it was a failure of imagination on the part of the enemy. Maybe they just thought we're on the rear echelon and nothing will ever happen. But the guys occupying the heavy rail bridge at Dillingen, Germany, big four-lane wide concrete bridge, simply were caught sleeping. One squad from our 66th Armored Infantry Battalion, led by Sergeant Les Porter, was able to get over the bridge, take out the Germans who were defending, and call in our ordnance men to defuse the bombs that were basically meant to drop the bridge into the river. What did this mean? This meant that divisions worth of equipment could cross the Rhine River in less than two hours. Meaning that the strong points, the holdouts, down in the southern, in Austria, in the Alps, where all the SS were hoping to escape and set up what they called the werewolf division, basically coming in and assassinating as many Americans as they could under cover of darkness, they never got a chance to get there. Meant a couple of other things too. First off, on our way down to Landsberg, we found a German airfield. Took out the sentries, captured it very quickly. Our guys captured 50 intact examples of Germany's wonder weapon, the Messerschmitt 262 Swallow jet fighter. Now, 
For that, if nothing else, the uh, dog faces all over Europe owe them a huge debt of gratitude. Because at that point in the war, the jet fighter was no longer being used to try to knock down American bombers or American fighters. It was being used solely as a ground attack aircraft. When they found a concentration of American troops, they would send the 262 loaded with fragmentation bombs to kill as many Americans as they could. Not because they thought it could stop the advance. The idea was to make the advance as costly to the United States as possible and possibly shake our resolve and put them in a better position to negotiate for peace. By the way, one more thing about capturing that intact rail bridge at Dillingen. It marks the first time in the history of mankind, the history of civilization, that an armed force crossed the Danube River under arms as invaders. Something that even the Roman legions had been unable to do. Julius Caesar is famous for having constructed a bridge across the Rhine River to show the Gauls that he could go anywhere he wanted to. In fact, he built a bridge across the Rhine on two separate occasions. However, when it came to the Danube, there was simply no way he could do it. So our guys are very proud of that fact. At any rate, getting past the Danube River meant that there was now literally no place in Germany that our guys couldn't invade. We could pour across divisions in a day and then spread out, basically advance across a wide front. What this also meant was the fact that this speed of advance saved probably hundreds of thousands of lives. Because two days after crossing the bridge at Dillingen, our boys happened upon the first of the concentration camps they liberated at Landsberg. Now, Landsberg, for a lot forward, I told you about the brick. It was one of the sub camps of the Dachau system. And something we have to explain to kids is the fact that. When America entered World War II, every man of draft age picked up a rifle and went and joined the military. How did we produce the goods of war with nobody in the factories? Well, we said women come into the factories. We created the Rosie the Riveter program, propaganda meant to ennoble the spirit of fighting women coming into the factories and doing things. Because before the war, women simply did not work outside the house. Very few did, and if they did, they were nurses, teachers, or secretaries. Well, suddenly we need women to become riveters, welders, uh, need to manufacture engines, tank treads, whatever we need. The Germans didn't do that. You see, Nazi propaganda had been in place since 1920. And by the time the Nazis took the majority and took over Germany in 1935, literally the entire generation of kids had been exposed to it daily. And to them, the greatest duty of any Aryan male was to carry a rifle for the fatherland. The greatest duty of any Aryan woman was to produce as many children as possible, in or out of wedlock, as long as the father was Aryan. Because their philosophy was that the Aryans were going to conquer the world, eliminate the undesirables, and repopulate. So they'd better get busy at it. So when they needed the manu to manufacture the goods of war, they simply took the groups of people that the Nuremberg Laws had turned into non-citizens basically subhuman, as they call them. Uh, Jewish people, anyone with a mental or physical handicap, gypsies, uh, what they call the lazy rich, and homosexuals. All of these people were kept in camps and suddenly being used as labor to produce whatever the fatherland asked for. Now the point of work at a concentration camp or a forced labor camp was simply to work the inmate to death. Get the maximum amount of work for the minimum amount of food and water and without any medical care. Our guys getting across the bridge at Dillingen and getting to Landsberg two days later meant that the Nazis did not have the chance to destroy camps before our men arrived. The first camp they liberated, Landsberg 4, was actually being burned to the ground, in the process of being burned to the ground when our guys got to it. And seeing that this was the pattern, our men simply decided, okay, we're going to get other people in here to take care of these people, we're going to keep moving and liberate these camps before the Germans could destroy them. A uh, couple of other artifacts we have here. And full disclosure, by the way, one of the reasons I teach about the Holocaust so passionately is that my family were largely victims of it. Uh, my great-grandparents were Hungarian Jews. 
My grandparents moved to the United States. My great-grandmother eventually escaped. And after the war, a few of our family members made it too. But 95% of my family who stayed behind in Hungary were exterminated by the Nazis. Uh, this piece of barbed wire, in fact, comes from the Auschwitz-Birkenau concentration camp, which is where most of my family was interned. So at any rate, pressing on, this is Ginger <coughs> in late spring of 1945. And not to blow the, my own horn too much or blow the horn of the men of this division too much, but possibly no other event <coughs> in the spring of 45 was as significant as capturing that intact bridge over the Danube because it was the first one captured and it was basically the way that our men were able to get to the rest of Germany and flood it with troops before serious resistance could start. So that's about all I have. I did bring artifacts. Uh, I've got stuff to look at, touch, play with, whatever. Any questions, feel free. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I saw the article about that Chautauqua, and that is from New York. And how does this relate to what I read in the flyer or the event for today? Or am I mistaken? I honestly don't know, because all I was told is terrible. I'm the executive director of my museum. Yes, sir. My wife is the uh, programs director. Right. So basically, my job is to work for her 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I know how that goes. Unlike a, lot, unlike a lot of guys, I don't find that a problem. I find it very comforting. Uh, and she simply said, we're talking about spring 45 and the role. Yes, Ken, can we I may be able to answer it. Good question, if you don't mind, because I'm swimming here. The Chautauqua series back, back, back in the early frontier days, um, I don't recall the exact dates, but back in the frontier days, uh, they would often have uh, scholars or smart people, lawyers, educated people travel to remote sections of the frontier on a seasonal basis, and it was a like a, it was a learning series. They would they would give talks very much like you, and those were called Chautauqua, which came, I believe, from an Indian word, a Native American word. I don't recall what it meant, but it came from out east. So this is something that started out east and it spread westward. So if you got that word Chautauqua series, it probably they're related in that they spring from the same historical context. Uh, there's a town in New York in Chautauqua, I remember right. No, there's Chautauqua, I know that. Yeah, but then, you know, too, there's the Lyceum speakers, you know, they go to the university, it's the same kind of thing, but on a little higher level. Exactly. Yeah, there's exactly. a number of programs like that. Yeah, I it, think they're great. It was a vehicle, it was a vehicle as a way to spread the skill of reading, for example. Most of the people were illiterate. Yeah, they were right, they were illiterate. Had a major third, fourth grade education. Mm -hmm. My dad called himself a fifth grade dropout, that's as far as he went. <laughs> Very thankful. Thank you. That was good. Tell us again the names of the rivers of the towns that were involved there. Okay. Um, the, the crossing of the Danube River happened at Dillingen. Dillingen? Yeah. You mentioned that, sir. Uh, that, that, that was the bridge. You said it was the first one they were in. Yeah, literally, literally the first, first one captured over the Danube River and the first time the invaders crossed the Danube under arms. Now, our crossing of the Rhine actually happened in Worms in late March. Uh, we got there, uh, I think, around the 27th, uh, created a good, stable, 12-mile-wide bridgehead, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and then engineers from four different armor divisions created pontoon bridges. And the problem with that is when you're crossing a river on a pontoon bridge, only one Sherman tank at a time can go over. So the minute you go over, you immediately become the loneliest man on that side of the river. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what we did was we had the artillery uh, battalions for each of the divisions pretty much destroy anything within line of sight that could house or hide a German gun. Um, and so they literally were crossing four tanks at a time, one on each bridge just as rapidly as possible. Mm -hmm. at, that, at that pace, you would generally get about a dozen tanks an hour across the bridge mm -hmm. uh, for each of those. So 48 tanks in one hour. Suddenly, you've got a sizable force. Mm -hmm. 
and the tanks would push forward and create basically a bubble uh, where the German artillery wouldn't be able to hit the bridges or the men crossing, and then the soft skin vehicles, right, the tanks and half, the uh, trucks and half tracks would come across. Uh -huh. Have you read the book uh, the Biography of Rudder? No, I've not. You know, he was the uh, senior officer of. Uh, was given the task of going to Point de Ho or however you said that. Point de Hoc, yeah. Point de Hoc, yeah. 